Shabbat Shalom. So this week, Starbucks introduced a brand new drink. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? The Unicorn Frappuccino. I'm not going to ask who's going out to have it. It's pink and glittery, and I think it's covered in whipped cream. Why wouldn't it be, right? It sparkles, and it is the fakest, most delicious looking food you'll ever see in your life. The unicorn frappuccino at Starbucks, no, they didn't pay me to say that this morning. Now, what's interesting, if that's the word I could use, about the unicorn frappuccino at Starbucks, there are 76 grams of sugar in it. That's the equivalent, is what I understand, of about 30 Hershey Kisses or an entire bag of Hostess Donut Holes. Now just imagine, let's say you put a child, maybe nine, ten years old, in a room by himself, herself, with that unicorn frappuccino, pink and glittery and covered in whipped cream, and you put them in a room and said, you have 30 minutes to sit here, but don't drink it. How many 9 and 10 year olds would not be able to drink it? They'd all drink it. Now imagine if you put that same 9 or 10 year old into that room with the unicorn frappuccino for 30 minutes. And you told them, now you can drink this, but it's got 76 grams of sugar in it. How long do you think before the 9 or 10 year old drinks the frappuccino? 60 seconds? Two seconds. Two seconds? There you go. Now imagine if you take that drink covered in whipped cream and you take a nine or a ten year old who keeps kosher and who just happened to have a hamburger and you put them in that room for 30 minutes and say, you can drink this but it's dairy. How many nine or ten year olds who keep kosher, who just ate a hamburger, would drink the frappuccino? I would tell you probably none. Probably none. The 76 grams of sugar wasn't enough to keep the child from drinking the frappuccino. But you take someone who keeps kosher and you say, you can't drink this for religious reasons, and they won't. It's an interesting motivation. Let's say, for example, you take perhaps a balding bearded rabbi and you place him in a room with chocolate chip cookies and you say, you can eat them, but you know, they're not so good for you. How long before that balding bearded rabbi happens to eat the cookies? I will tell you, not very long at all. But if they're dairy cookies, and I just had a meat meal, I mean, if this balding bearded rabbi just had a meat meal, <laughs> I could tell you he'd be willing to wait three hours before eating that very same plate of cookies. It's a different motivation. I will tell you, my wife will certainly tell you that healthy and not healthy are not always what drive my decision-making. But if something is for religious reasons, it takes on a whole other level of motivation. We are called upon this week of Parashat Shmini to begin reflecting on our motivations for the choices we make. As children, they're guided by different motivations. Their frontal lobe is still developing. We adults, though, we have our own motivations, and I would venture to say that those motivations differ each and every one of us in this room. So we are this week in Parashat Shmini, and just as our Benot Mitzvah have told us, 
We're reading primarily about Aaron and the Kohanim and the high priests and how they were in charge of the tabernacle, that ancient sanctuary in the wilderness, and ultimately the Beit HaMikdash, the holy temple as well. But then we come to Leviticus chapter 11, and you're welcome to turn with me, if you like, to page 637 in your Eitz Chaim Chumashim. And on page 637, the Torah begins to lay out for us additional laws of kashrut, of keeping kosher. Earlier in Exodus, we were told not to boil a kid in its mother's milk. But here in Leviticus, we're told much more about the laws of kashrut. That the only animals you may eat from are among land animals. Animals that have true hooves, split hooves, and chew their cud. We come to read about the sea creatures and the birds that we're allowed to eat and those that we're prohibited from eating. And all the while we're left to wonder why we're allowed certain foods and why we're prohibited certain foods. And we come then to page 642, the end of chapter 11. And here I am in verse 44 and we have really the entire explanation for the laws of Kashrut. Again, page 642, verse 44. God says, Ki ani Adonai Elohechem, For I, the Lord, am your God. You shall sanctify yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. And that's it. That's why we're told to keep kosher. Because God says to. Because God's holy and we're supposed to be like God. And this food system that we called kashrut is all about holiness. It's all about kiddushah. And this word kiddushah, which we often translate as holiness, really comes to mean separate, distinct, different, unique. Now since the Torah, our rabbis have tried to give us lots of different explanations as to why we keep kosher. Some say it's strictly for this idea of separating, that we should be, as we came into this new land, as we came into Israel, a distinct people. And some archaeologists say you can actually see the map of ancient Israel based on where they've found pig bones and where they haven't. And you can actually map out where our people lived based on these archaeological finds. Rabbi Moshe Isserlis, the 17th century rabbi who wrote a Nashkenazi commentary to the Shulchan Aruch, he said the entire point of the system of kashrut is to prevent intermarriage. If you can't eat with a Gentile and you can't drink with a Gentile, you're not going to marry a Gentile. And so for Rabbi Isserlis, the entire point of the system of kashrut is to prevent intermarriage. Now, I was just turned on to a new website, thanks to my friend in the back of the room, Allison Gutman, who's now with Chazon, called Neo Hasid. It's an interesting website. You should check it out. And Neo Hasid, he comes to, this rabbi comes to suggest that perhaps there's a different reason for the system of kashrut. He said, if you look at the kind of animals, land animals, we were permitted to eat, they chew their cud and they have split hooves. This system eliminates hunting by and large as a way of gaining food. Jews don't hunt. Don't tell my father-in-law. But if we keep kosher, Jews can't hunt the way others can hunt. We have to use domesticated animals. And these domesticated animals that chew their cud and have split hooves don't eat human food. They eat grass, they eat hay that we can't eat. And so in this way, with this system of kashrut, this neo-chasid comes to suggest, you've now taken away the economic competition between the herders and the farmers. Perhaps the system of kashrut is based on some sort of idea of economic fairness or economic justice or perhaps just 
some variant of capitalism alone so that everybody could do what they needed to do in order to eat. It's an interesting theory, just as good as any of the other theories. But at the end of the day, we're left with the reason that we keep kosher is because God says, and that's why. Now today is not only Parashat Shmini, today is another day on the calendar. Anyone know? Earth Day. Today is Earth Day. I know all of you probably lit candles to begin Earth Day last night as well. Is that how one begins Earth Day? I don't even know. But on Earth Day, we're called upon to be mindful of the world that we live in. We're called upon to think about the impact that we make on the environment with our choices each and every day. Now, there are all sorts of Jewish laws with how we treat the environment. Many of them are contained in a Jewish value called Baal Tashchit, you shall not waste. And I came across an interesting statistic. One third of all edible food goes to waste. One third of all edible food goes to waste. Think about the number of people starving around the world. One third of all edible food goes to waste. When you think about so many of the Jewish laws, when you come upon a city to besiege it, it says in Deuteronomy, you shall not cut down the fruit trees. It's a waste. When you harvest your fields, you don't harvest the corners of the field or that which has fallen to the floor, to the ground. You leave it for the poor people to come and pick it up. You don't let it go to waste. So many of our laws are about not being wasteful. Think about at Shabbos lunch, how much of our plate gets tossed into the garbage, including the plate itself. Yet we're told not to be wasteful. Is that enough? Is it enough that the Torah tells us not to be wasteful? Is it enough that 2,000 years worth of rabbinic tradition tell us that we have to care for the environment? That we have an obligation to care for the environment? How much does that really impact us? Are you recycling today because the Torah tells you you're supposed to? Is that why you're doing it? Could you do more? And what motivating factor would be enough to tip you over from what you're doing today to doing one step more. What's the motivating factor? What's the tipping point? What piece of information or knowledge, what experience do you need to have that would cause you to respect the earth, to care for the environment just a little bit more than you are today? Is it health? Is it Jewish food? Is it Jewish law? Is it the idea that maybe you could help somebody else? What is it that would tip you just a little bit to change your life, to care for the environment a little bit more? We come back to the reason that we keep kosher in the Torah. The Torah says, you shall be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. God said to Noah at the time of the flood, you may eat of any of the animals of the earth. I give them to you. Now, interesting, God did not say that to Adam and Eve. We were vegetarian until the time of Noah. And then God said to Noah, go ahead, eat the animals. But God says to the Jewish people, yes, all of these animals may be eaten, but you can't eat them all. You have to distinguish, you have to differentiate. You have to, even when you do something as simply primitive as putting food in your mouth, just like all the animals of the earth do, we eat. You have to be holy. You have to be mindful of what you're putting into your mouth. And God says to us in Genesis, the earth is yours. You have dominion over it. God says, I give you the earth. But for us Jews, God says, but you can't quite do with it anything you want to do with it. You have to be mindful. You can't waste. 
You have to use the earth to care for those who are in need, to protect future generations. You have to be a little different in how you treat this world. The animals don't think about it like that. The animals just do whatever they need to do to survive. But you humans and you Jews need to think a little bit differently. You need to act based on this idea of holiness. Now we know the story often told that God says to Moses, you shall not boil a kid, a baby goat, in its mother's milk. And Moses looks back up to God and says, okay God, so I'm not allowed to eat cheeseburgers, right? God says, no, 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 Moses. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. So Moses says back to God, so I can't have milk and meat together at least a three hour separation, right? God says, Moses, you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Moses says, so I'm not allowed to mix chicken and cheese then together, right? God says to Moses, you know what? Do it however you want to do it. <laughs> but the idea is, Kiroshim to you ki kadosh ani. I, the Lord, your God, am holy, and thus you shall be holy too. You have to transcend your animal instincts in order to live a life of holiness. We do that with our food. We do that with our calendar. We have to do it with the environment as well. On this Earth Day, a secular holiday, let us remember that God expects something of us. God is watching how we care for the earth and how we care for the animals and all the creatures that are on this earth. God expects us to be different. God expects us to strive for holiness. This Shabbat of Earth Day, I ask you, what is the motivating factor? What is the tipping point in your life that prevents you from drinking that 76 gram frappuccino? that encourages you to keep kosher? And what is that tipping point that will allow you to take one more step in our obligation, in fulfilling our obligation to protect the world in which we live? Kei may this be God's will. And let us say it together.